Magandang umaga po. <laughs> now I'm lost. <clears throat> Thank you for accepting me and my wife. We're so thankful to be part of this church. And let's open in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together here. Thank you for all that you've done in each of our lives. Please humble us this morning. Remind us that we're all sinners saved by grace. Those of us who've repented and put our faith and trust in you. Um, that you're no respecter of persons. And that there's none righteous, no, not one. Please speak through me, set a watch upon my lips, that I would speak nothing beyond your truth. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. This morning the pastor read and we all read together, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and there is none righteous, no, not one. So who in here now thinks they're a finished work? Perfect. Nobody, not one. So we believe what the Bible says. The Lord has the power to turn forgiven sin into ministry. If we walk through something difficult, we're much better prepared after we've repented and given it up to the Lord. We're much better prepared to help someone going through a similar situation. And sometimes the most difficult part is sharing that difficult struggle that's, that can be embarrassing for us to share. But that's part of our calling to take up our cross and follow him or we're not worthy of him. Many of us have a struggle that continues to resurface. Even though we've repented, put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're fighting to follow him. A struggle may continue to resurface. Maybe it's gossip or anger or pornography or gluttony. Something that we're, we continue to fight and maybe we'll fight until the day we take our last breath. When we give our lives to Christ, we, we sign on to war against the flesh, against the devil, against the world. And that struggle continues. Let me share a story. I shared my testimony when we first came to the church. I told you the truth, but I left out a few details until the relationship was built and the Lord led to share. I've made the mistake often of coming into the church day one, coming into a new fellowship and sharing too much and being kind of judged accordingly and kind of ostracized. So I tried to be a little wiser about this this time around. A young boy was raised in the church, accepted Christ at a young age, about seven years old. Felt tempted toward the same sex, about 12 years old when puberty came. The other boys liked the girls. I did not. I liked the boys and only the boys. No attraction to women, so it wasn't a choice of choosing one temptation or another or a little side inclination. It was full attraction to the same sex and no attraction to women. Um... I cried myself to sleep many nights. I prayed the Lord would take it away. I, I grew up in a small town in the province. I couldn't talk to anyone about it. We were in the church. My parents were the head of the youth group um, in my teens. The, we were close with the pastor and his wife. They would come over to visit and um, after the service on Sunday night sometimes and have, have uh, tea with the family and that sort of thing. And I had questions that I couldn't ask. They were killing me inside. So I cried myself to sleep many nights. It's very difficult. And prayed the Lord would take away the temptation. When he didn't take away that temptation, then I tried to convince myself the temptation was so strong in the teen years. Anyone who's a man here especially knows how, how strong lust can be. So it took baby steps toward pictures, then videos, then a little bit more and a little bit more and things I shouldn't, shouldn't be looking at, and then moved to the city, from the province into the city where no one knew who I was. So the pre people living beside me didn't know what I was doing or who I was or care. And so then I started to drink. So never, never got drunk until I was 21. And when I did, that started the landslide. That started the kind of counterfeit courage that now I can do anything and, and kind of barely remember it happened and that sort of thing. So I would do things and then try to forget, oh, that didn't really happen because I don't really remember it so much. And then wait for another week or two and do something similar and deeper and deeper and deeper. So long story short, Satan walked me in steps. He's the counterfeit of how the Lord, we, we repent, put our faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We follow him. We become more and more like him day by day. He changes us from the inside out. Satan does the same thing, you could say, in the counterfeit, the broad path that leads to destruction. So my advice to, a, to someone who's, who's struggling, maybe... 15, 16, 17 years old is don't take the small steps because you won't go from, from nothing to deep, deep sin if you don't take the small steps. I think in my case, if I hadn't start, started drinking, I probably wouldn't have had the guts. I was very timid, very meek little guy. 
I wouldn't have had the guts to go out and did all, do all the horrible things I did. So homosexuality, bakla, you might say in Filipino culture, makes people uncomfortable. Ugh. It's For generations, the church has refused to address it until governments like the U.S. and Canada and European governments have forced it into the limelight through gay rights and gay marriage and that sort of thing. Um, we're still reluctant, though. I think, I think sometimes talk of secret sins and double lives bring convictions of our, of our own sin struggles. I've noticed that coming into a church and you share something and it's like everyone else, when, typically when you meet in a Bible study, um, people say, well, the light, the light bulb's broken in my apartment and my kid got sick yesterday and things like that. And I think there has to be something else because we all have something we struggle with. There has to be something deeper, but I think we're afraid to say it because of the gossip and, and things that go on in the church because we're all human and we struggle with a multitude of things. Uh, so I cried. Okay, back to the testimony. Cried and prayed the Lord would take it away, the temptation. He didn't. Tried to convince myself it was okay to act on it, double life, and so on. Um, I w it was very convincing, and I think that's where the compassion comes in when you see someone who's, who's gone to have surgeries to try to become like, like another sex, and, and you think, wow, that seems really far out and really strange and really bizarre. It's really difficult to describe. I, I didn't have that type of exact deception, but, but I was deceived in a, in a similar way. And it's very, very convincing. The enemy can really take you to a place where you feel like, this is just who I am. And then the, the Lady Gagas and the, the folks on, on TV and movies and that sort of thing are saying, baby, you were born this way. You're born to die in it. You have no choice. Sorry. Can you imagine? So it's a death sentence, and, and it comes with a happy face and, and, and a funny guy on TV who wants to dress up the women and likes the nicest high heels and has the funniest joke and that sort of thing. But it's horrible. It's a horror story. It's pain underneath it all, disguised by the enemy to look glamorous. So in the beginning, we went into the gay bars, and, and so exciting and so fun, and I spent the whole week to decide what I would wear that weekend, and, and a big deal, and, and just glamour and going, going into the on the red carpet to the bar and we got in before everybody else because we were young and cute and things like that. And then three, four, five, six years in, late 20s, early 30s, a friend had HIV, went to a hotel room, committed suicide. Another friend overdosed, too much drugs. Um, it seemed like every time I went back to the bar there was somebody who used to sit right over here and was gone now and jumped out of a window or something. Sometimes we didn't even know what happened to them. so. It's kind of like the enemy was revealed, the wolf in sheep's clothing, the one that I thought I was following because he was going to take me to somewhere fabulous and I was going to be famous and you have all these kind of delusions of grandeur. Uh, I was convinced I would be a model, by the way, because I was tall. So everybody, everybody in the gay bar said, oh, you'll be a model. You have to go to New York. You'll be a runway model. You make so much money. Oh, wow. You know, and then it never happened. The enemy does not deliver on his promises. The Lord always does. So we go with the Lord who delivers on the promise and and we know we can trust him. So doctrinally, was I, was I responsible for following the temptation? Yes, Genesis chapter 3. We we're tempted by the enemy, but we're still accountable. The world tries to tell us through human psychologists and PhDs and that sort of thing, tries to remove accountability, but we know that we're, we're responsible no matter how great the deception is. It's still our choice whether or not to follow it. Are we responsible for being tempted? Biblically, Matthew chapter 4, even Christ was tempted by the enemy. So we're not responsible for the temptation. And that's where I was, I think I kind of was convinced, you already failed. The, how the enemy kind of comes in and says, you already failed because you already feel this. This is who you are. It's because of something you did. And now you just have to give up. Just throw in the towel. Just go with it. And then he, he took me almost to my death. So 2010, I was in a... A city, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, I had moved around to different cities and got worse and worse. I wasn't showing up for work on time. I was telling them I was in a car accident when, when I was just woke up late because I was so drunk and things like that. And um, the Lord brought me to my knees in repentance. There was a, an evangelist on the street one time. I went into McDonald's. He came in and followed me and stood behind me and said, where will you go when, if you died today? And I thought, wow, so... Unless my parents know this guy, I don't think they do because I'm in a city where... So this has to be the Lord himself is trying to talk to me. Wow. So 
I, before I was kind of like piggybacked on my family's face, and then, then now I'm seeing that the Lord himself from the throne is reaching down to me, but who am I? Why would he do this to me? I'm doomed to live this life. This is who I am. So, so the Lord's kind of worked piece by piece and then reminded me of end times prophecy, and really the bottom line was the fear of the Lord is what he brought what he used to bring me back. It was conviction that he's coming back in judgment. 9-11 happened. I'm 41 today, so it was a few years ago. But 9-11 happened. They woke up from a drunken stupor. There's the, the World Trade Center collapsing and everything, and I just sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. The Lord's finally bringing judgment on my country. What's going to happen next? Is it, is it really the end? So um, got on my knees at the bed in 2010, there was a, a young guy scheduled to come over and spend the weekend with me I'd never seen in my life. It was just how I lived, just a pathetic, disgusting life. And the Lord got me to my knees then through some interesting things that happened in the days before and brought me to repentance, put my faith and trust back in him. When the, when the guy came, I said, I can't do this. And I took him to church that Sunday, and that was the beginning of a new life. Praise the Lord for second chances. So I don't say this to go on and on and on about myself, but I think this is the big issue these days. And everybody here, can I get a show of hands? Does everyone know someone? Everyone have a friend who struggles with this? How many of you don't? Wow, I thought it would be everybody. When we go to the Philippines, we see a lot, a lot of openly, open homosexuality. Not so much in in Cambodia, but, but a little more, I think, day by day in modern times. Um, okay, so praise the Lord for second chances. The Lord brought healing in the family. Um, the Bible says we don't have a high priest that cannot be touched with a <laughs> cannot be uh, touched without the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like like we are yet without sin so we know that the lord understands the temptations that we have even when they're strange and sometimes in in the beginning in those first first days i knew he was the only one that i could trust i try to go some to someone in the church and you get kind of a mixed response they don't really understand unless they've been through it themselves and so it it, it brought a very close relationship with the lord i joined a i joined kind of a a group where they were saying, we're bringing men together who struggle with sexual sin, and they brought us together, and I don't want to pass judgment on the group, but I think it, it, there's value in, in saying how it worked. So we were all kind of together, and they took us out to, to the park, and we, we would meet in a group and have kind of a little service on, I think it was Thursday night, and then they took us out to a park one day, and they said, okay, now we're going to sit like this because we're all men and things like this, and I thought, wow, this seems like a fleshly response to a spiritual problem. It doesn't seem like I'm going to start, so I'm going to start putting on an act like I'm some kind of actor to try to be more manly, rather than let the Lord change me from the inside as I follow him. So anyway, it was strange, and call it what you want, I, d I don't want to sound crazy, but there was a man who came down the street in, beside this park where we were all sitting, and he, he yelled, I think he might have been a homeless man, I don't know, but um, he said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And I thought, that's what I need to be doing, not this. So that's what I did. I went out and lived just like any other believer. I got into a regular Bible study, not a Bible study for strange people or anything. Not that that's, you know, maybe, um, maybe sometimes we need to get into groups for specific things. But for me, the Lord called me to just be um, the normal believer that we got into a Bible study and, and started studying the Word and started fighting to follow the Lord, dying daily to self. Maybe he gave it a little extra grace where I needed it. Maybe some of us don't have um, quite the same struggles, so maybe he gives extra grace for some of us in times of need. But um, it's, the approach really was just a normal approach that all of us are called to take. Uh, the enemy's game, to go back to the testimony, the enemy's game was to get my parents to endorse my lifestyle, and which, requ which would require them to turn their backs on the Lord. So the whole thing was, I was, the enemy was like the snake coiled around me. So I'm thinking, they need to accept, accept me for who I am. I'm gay and they're going to like it. And blah, blah. So I'm calling my parents and yelling profanities at them and everything, just, just angry and bitter. And eventually my dad said, step back. He said to my mom, step back. 
don't, don't answer the phone when he calls anymore. This, this war is above us. It's, it's out of control. So they, they went to war in prayer and fasting. He said, when I called home the last few times, there was a different voice coming through the phone, if you know what I mean. So it was that intense. Um, the Bible says, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places, Ephesians 6.12. So they, they prayed that bad things would happen to me. That sounds strange to think that your parents would pray for awful things to happen to you. And I didn't agree with it af immediately after the fact, but when the Lord grew me a little bit, I could see the wisdom in it that they wanted me to be brought, brought to my knees. And now when we go out to minister to folks, that's where I don't think that someone who everything's going okay for them and they still think gay life is glamorous and they still believe they're going to be a fashion model and things like that, I don't think they're going to be called to repentance very easily. I think they're going to have to hit rock bottom and then look up. And then, Lord willing, you've already shared with them or you can share with them at that moment and they know who can help. So, the Lord's mercies are new every morning. Lamentations, praise the Lord. He brought me, out, brought me up out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. He put a new song in my mouth, even praise to our God. Many shall see it, fear, and trust in the Lord. Psalm 40. So praise the Lord for his boundless grace and mercy. Just have some kind of advice and tips, I think, on the next slide. I'm young and... I'm young and I'm struggling. How should I avoid the same pitfall? I, I would say don't take the first steps. We already covered that, so this is the next one. How should we fight against temptation? Separate from old life friends. So I didn't go from new life in Christ and then out to the gay bar to try to win people to Christ. The Lord separated me for many, many years and still... I'd, I am not authorized to go into a bar situation or something like that. We go to the street, maybe we walk by a massage parlor or something, we stand outside, witness to folks outside of a bar or something, but we don't go inside. The pastor recommended that recently too, and the Lord's convicted me on, on that sort of thing, not to go so far as to go into the, the bar. Um, sometimes we'll go and get a foot massage or something and witness to folks. but. Um, Separate from old life friends, so that's just like any believer, right? We repent, put our faith and trust in the Lord. We don't stay friends with the world and be heavily influenced. Our barcada does not, does not consist of all worldly people. It consists of believers. Separate from old life friends. Find your identity in Christ. Typically, that means what's the gift the Lord's given us. He's given us each a gift, that, like a children's message. Everybody has a gift. We're all called to do something. Everybody can do something well. What's your gift? So the, the person typically who's in the kind of life that I was in comes home from work or whatever they do, if they're even functional to do that, and then d does a, a lot of things related to their addictions, their sin struggles. So on the porn sites and that sort of thing. So what do you do in your new life in Christ? You get plugged into your identity in Christ. What are you called to do? You get in the Word daily and pray daily that we're all called to do. And then maybe you, you start to play guitar or whatever the Lord's given you as a gift so that you feel fulfilled and you feel satisfied in Christ. And your alone time with the Lord in, in Scripture reading and prayer gives you that intimacy that you were trying to get from people, right? You're out running around trying to get it from some man maybe because you were sexually abused in the past or something like that. A lot of folks who struggle with this kind of thing have that in their path. So find your identity in Christ. War against the flesh to follow Christ. Resist the devil and he will flee. Take every thought captive. So there's a lot, there's a lot of stuff here in the mind of someone who's been out in the world for 10 years or so in deep, deep sin, and the enemy will try to bring all that stuff back at pivotal moments when you're weakest. So take every thought captive. Flush out lies with the truth. Read the Bible daily. Renewing of the mind through the reading of the word, Romans 12, 2. Share testimony in the gospel. Um, in the beginning, when I first started talking to folks in this ministry, I was really championing, you need to tell everybody, you need to share your testimony to everybody. But I think for those of us who have never gone out and really acted on this in a in an extreme way like I did, I think sometimes it can be detrimental 
because if I come in here and sit down and say, I have a struggle with, with pornography or something, and I share that broadly to the whole church, and then everybody's going to be checking in with me every Sunday, how's that struggle going? <laughs> and that sort of thing. So maybe you, you tell a kind of a trusted friend, brother, can you pray for me? I, I slipped up yesterday, that sort of thing. And that's wiser, I think, than sharing with the broad audience. Okay. Share testimony in the gospel. In my case, it was very liberating. It's been very liberating to go out and share the gospel. Satan was defeated by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. So we're standing here and saying, the Lord owns me. I'm covered in the blood of Christ. I don't belong to you anymore. And we're saying that to the enemy in the world, and that's very powerful in liberating. And it also keeps a watchful eye because even the world's watching then, and you know you're accountable. Okay, so they're watching everything you do to make sure you're not like you say you were before. <laughs> Uh, keep busy. Uh, idle time is the devil's workshop, so keep busy is good. And the Lord, the Lord really keeps us busy. He has our works laid out for us in advance, right? So we have no reason to be bored or, or not know what to do. How should I reach out to a loved one who's living a gay or transgender lifestyle? This should be the next slide. How can I reach out to... This is a common question. We go to talk to churches and they'll say, I have a friend who's living this kind of life. I don't know what to say to him. It's so sticky. So we say, be humble. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. I think the silver bullet in the gospel for the LGBT is for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God because I think automatically we go out to witness to somebody and they think, so you're saying that you're good and I'm bad. No, that's not at all what we're saying. We're saying for all have sin, we're all in the same boat, and we're all called to repentance. The Bible judges us. The Word of God judges us, not, not each other. Um, be humble. We're, we're all born in sin, called to repentance and new life in Christ. Build trust. Demonstrate Christ-like love. That's, that's a challenge to be faithful. So we go and, and share with, with folks. Um, down in old market area, maybe maybe we the Lord leads kind of interestingly to someone, and then we think we need to go back once a week and just stop by, and, and it's it's a challenge to be faithful in that because sometimes it feels like you're just saying soak so by and and the usual things, and sometimes it feels like it's not going anywhere. But but I think the Lord's really really pushing us to be faithful in that to show them that someone really cares for them and someone's going to be there and someone's going to be consistent for them and maybe bring them a green tea every now and then and that sort of thing. And then we share as the Lord leads. Um, share a word in due season. Um, I've been accused of sharing more than a word in due season, so sometimes I think... <laughs> share the truth in love. Love the sinner, hate the sin. Do not endorse the lifestyle. And wow, that can get sticky too. You go, we go down to a, a place where someone's... Um, living like a lady boy, and kind of their whole identity is wrapped up, their, their perception of who they are is wrapped up in that they're dressing like a woman and everything, and, they're, and so they're be cracking jokes all the time about, about the fact that they look like a man in the morning and a woman in the afternoon or something like that, and you're kind of like, okay, Lord, what sh how should I be responding to all these little things? So it's sticky. Um, even after salvation, it can be a long way out. Be patient. Point them to Christ for intimacy. And mind your testimony. Satan will try to discredit the messenger. So Satan will often try to make us look bad. Uh, a lot of times, I think in Buddhist culture, like here, and probably also Catholic culture, like the Philippines, I think everywhere, the unbeliever is looking like, is he or is he not a good person? And we know that biblically nobody's a good person, but for the sake of evangelism, we kind of have to prove to a degree that we're a good person in order to earn the right to be heard, right? Because if the unbeliever looks like a better person than we are, they're not going to listen to us. They're going to stay in Buddhism. So the book of James says that uh, mercy triumphs over judgment. We're to, we're to extend the same level of mercy to people that was extended to us. I've been such a Jonah for this kind of ministry. My wife and I want to move on. We want to have a baby. We want to sit in the back of the church. We don't want to do the sticky stuff. <laughs> so I've been a real Jonah, but the Lord's kind of dragged me into it and um, so it's not easy uh, what is homosexuality biblically homosexuality is a result of the fall of man it's a result of denying and disobeying God 
we know that the heart is deceitful enough on its own, but we also know that Rom Romans chapter 1 indicates that homosexuality is not natural to man. So it strongly indicates it's inspired by the enemy. Who changed the truth of God into a lie? Romans chapter 1, 25. And worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God, for this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. We know also from the, from the story of Sodom and Gomorrah how the angels blinded the guys who were who were groping for them and they continued to grope that's kind of a, a visual of how intense the lust can be the how overwhelming the lust can be kind of like when we feed the sin it grows and grows and grows like a fire that just consumes our life uh, God is not the author of confusion so who is Colossians 14 33 for God is not the author of confusion but of peace we know that this deception is so high level that it calls people to dismember their own bodies. So just imagine, for the, for the glory of Satan. On the bright side, just imagine if someone's willing to dismember their own body to chop off and, and reconstruct certain things. What, it, imagine if that person was willing to run that hard toward Christ. If they were willing to throw it all down and glorify Christ like they glorified Satan in their old life. Imagine what kind of warrior Christian that would be. So that's what our prayer for is for one here in, in CM Reap that would be willing to do that. Would be willing to really lay it all down, surrender all, and fight to follow for Christ. Um, the Bible lists many sins that are an abomination or disgusting to the Lord. Homosexuality is one of them. However, it is not the unpardonable sin. Wherever I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. So sometimes we think of it as a horrible, it is disgusting to, to us who have not dealt with it, especially it seems like, oh, that's out of, that's like an alien thing that's out of the realm of even imagination. So it seems so disgusting that it seems like, how could the Lord ever forgive that? But it really is a forgivable sin, biblically. So... Uh, know ye that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. Whew. I'm so thankful for that verse. Of such were some of you. But ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Amen. Amen. So I praise the Lord for verse 11. There is a way out of a homosexual lifestyle. We're not defined by the type of sin that tempts us. There hath no temptation taken you such as, such as is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way of escape that ye may be able to bear it. So to clarify, temptation is not sin, but following temptation is sin. So approaches, approaches to this, this kind of struggle, this kind of temptation, this type of sin. The world says, baby, you were born this way. It's an identity you can't change. The truth is that we're all born in sin, so there's a little bit of truth in that statement. We're born in sin, but thanks to Calvary, thanks to the finished work at Calvary, we're not doomed to remain in it. Gay Christian is an oxymoron. There's an approach to this that says, I'm a gay Christian, and I, I met one of those guys recently and had, a, had it out with him. And um, it's, it's not possible to be a, someone who identifies as gay and also Christian. Uh, the movement twists what parts of the word they choose to read. This, this particular young man was, um, said that he didn't know the Bible very well, and he said, I'm many, I'm many things. I'm a Christian, but I'm also many, many other things. And so he was kind of marginalizing the Word of God. Often they'll say that, they'll twist stories, they'll say that the story of David and Jonathan was a homosexual love affair, and other things that are so disgusting that you don't even want to, to mention. Um, ministries approach this issue a number of different ways. So ministries within churches or within, um, within the body of Christ or 
or assemblies that call themselves churches, most of them, most people who consider the temptation unwanted work tirelessly to try to fix it. So as to be all-inclusive, many, many ministries operate like an AA, like an Alcoholics Anonymous, in the sense that they do not stand on the exclusivity of Christ, that, that anyone can come in, a Muslim can come into the group, and a Catholic, and a born-again believer, and we're all kind of mixed-mixed, and you don't dare get too close to the gospel because it might be offensive to somebody, so it's kind of whatever higher power somewhere, somehow, you might believe in, kind of, sort of. So without the power of the Holy Spirit, um, it's not going anywhere, right? Um, some Pentecostal ministries take flack for treating it as demon possession, performing exorcisms. Problem is that if the temptation remains after the exorcism, the strong implication, like faith healing, is that it's because your faith isn't strong enough. You may as well give up. So it can be very discouraging, can encourage discouragement to the point of apostasy or even suicide in a, in a demographic of people where suicide rates are very, very high. So this is kind of like a microcosm of all the, all the things that we deal with in the mainstream church kind of magnified in this struggle because um, the people are very, very sensitive and very fragile. And so the, the impact of a false teaching can be very, very great on people in this kind of situation. Many who are not content with what the Bible says read, read countless Christian psychology books and hold the words of PhDs in higher regard than the Word of God. Reparative therapy, which promises deliverance from the temptation, which I don't believe the Bible broadly promises deliverance from temptation to sin, any more than it would promise deliverance from your temptation to steal or lie or gossip, right? We're to die daily to self to live for Christ. We war against the flesh, but the Bible doesn't broadly promise to X out all of our temptation. So... Um, has dragged the Lord's name through the mud, I believe. There's a high rate of recidivism in struggles such as these, and I think honesty is best. Coming, being someone who came into the church, I remember the pressure in 2010, the pressure of the church. You get up and share testimony, and then people were coming around you like, so you're, you're okay now, right? Like, they want, they want you to say, <laughs> and you, you feel like, oh, I, they want me to say this. I guess I have to say it. I don't know what they mean by okay. And if I go s so deep to tell them exactly what it, where I am with it, then it's too much information. It's just awkward. So, so um, I think honesty is best. We're, we're all, none of us is a finished work. We die daily to self to live for Christ. The call is the same regardless of what struggle we have. Many modern ministries favor forced accountability that, in my opinion, can stifle growth of some. So if you look at me and you think, okay, he has a struggle with this strange kind of sin, so that means that he's not up to par with the rest of us. We need to surround him and make sure that he's, um, that he's kept away from whatever challenges he has, I guess. Many advocate make, making ch changes in the flesh to be more manly rather than following Christ and allowing him to perform a work within. So accountability can, I think, can be a good thing, and it's, it's biblical. If, if I have a struggle with pornography, for example, maybe I go to the pastor and say, can you pair me up with a, with a guy in the church that you trust that'll, that won't tell anyone about this struggle so that I can share uh, once a week with him and let him know how it's going. We can pray together. I think that's a healthy thing, but not to force it on someone so that they feel like, Ugh, am I less than you or what are you saying? Or, okay, we advocate an approach no different from the approach every believer is called to take against his or her temptation. Repent, be born again, war against the flesh, the world, and the devil. The purpose of sharing this type of testimony is to glorify the Lord. My dad says that when we glorify the Lord, often we look bad and he looks good. <laughs> and to pave the way for others coming after us. Does anyone in here like to go hiking or trekking? I've seen some of your, your Facebook pictures. Um, one of you has Facebook pictures of, of snorkeling, scuba diving, things like that, so I know some of you like adventure. How about trekking, jungle trekking or hiking? So I think of, of discipleship as, as kind of trekking. We're called to walk the narrow, difficult path that leads to eternal life. We're following Christ on the path and there are people coming behind us. And as we see a pothole, oh, I tripped and fell in that pothole, or this branch smacked me across the face. So I yell back, hey, Kuya, there's a pothole over here. Hey, Ate, there's a, there's a branch just hit me in the face. Don't learn the hard way like I did, right? So that's discipleship. And 
Having endured Pierce persecution for speaking this testimony, in my opinion, the church should, should function to encourage each of us in our personal relationship with Christ. Um, due to the una unusual nature of my past and maybe the conviction or unease that sharing it brings, the church has often been more of a hindrance than a help. And I kind of hinted to that before, but I didn't tell you exactly why in the last, the last time I shared. But I would imagine that none of those kinds of people are here today, that all of us want to seek to be an encouragement, not a stumbling block to those fighting to follow Christ. We work out our, our salvation with fear and trembling. We war against sin, and, and we will until we take our final breath. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. So through Christ we can have victory. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So the ministry calls the church to, if you think about it, you're, you're thinking, how can we... If we brought one person in here um, today, how could we kind of how could we kind of help that person or be available to that person or be welcoming to that person? I think this ministry calls calls us to purity. It kind of calls us to, to honesty and purity within the body. It calls us to evangelism to get out and share Christ with people. Um, we we talk about that a lot. Not all of us do that faithfully, and it's tough to keep, to be faithful in that calls for greater unity in the body. It calls for sanctification to remove the barriers that would, that would keep us from being honest with each other. If gossip is a big struggle for some of us, we, we should try to, to avoid gossip so that other people feel comfortable to share what they're really going through. Um, the value of our testimony should be held high. My pastor growing up said that his, his testimony was the most valuable thing he owns because everybody's looking for the sake of evangelism, everybody's watching your testimony, and for um, there's been so much hypocrisy and so on in the church, I think a lot of times the unbelievers are, are looking for any excuse to, to shoot a hole through your testimony to make it, make it appear that they would have an excuse not to believe. How can the church help? Unity in the body of Christ. Welcome and accept all despite the sin struggle. Call all to repentance. So this is the difference between... This approach, the, the, you could say the Bible Baptist approach or the, the modern church approach is we're, we're to call all to repentance, to demonstrate abundant grace, to be patient with other shortcomings, and to stop beating up the broken. Praise the Lord for all he's done and for all that we trust he will do as we fight to follow. One other thing that just came to mind, I talked to a pastor several years ago, and there, there are many modern church movements that are, that are kind of... Um, going kind of overboard with, with loving um, it to such a point that I think it's not biblically Christ-like. So, so they're saying that this pastor was telling me of a, of a church that he knew of where everybody was welcome to come, and it was a modern church kind of community center type of thing, so that they're welcome to come, and you just kind of say God is good. You don't really share the full gospel about um, repentance and new life in Christ and coming judgment. And so he said that men, some men were even coming in skirts, coming in a dress. And I was fresh out of that old life, and, and I remember thinking, if the Lord brought me into the service in a dress, I think it would be a short time before he had me out of the dress into a pair of pants. So I don't think someone can come in here and sit under solid doctrine, solid Bible teaching, and, and continue to live in that lifestyle. They will either avoid, avoid the church like the plague, <laughs> or they will come back and repent ultimately. So we're so thankful to be part of this congregation. Thank you for listening. I know it's not easy. And uh, let's end in prayer. Dear Lord, thank you for all that you've done for us. Thank you for your boundless grace and mercy where sin abounded. Grace